that I think we all kind of collectively agree on. Liquidity injection that drove up the markets, and now that liquidity is going to leave. So we're seeing the after effects of it or front running those effects, as Shaylin has clearly uh, kind of pointed out pretty articulated really well. And also we have an external factor that's kind of out of our control, which is the war or kind of, you know, Russia and Ukraine tension that we've been trying to navigate through. And it's really unfortunate and it's affected other parts of economics and global trade, right? So I think this question comes up pretty much daily. I think a lot of us have shared many things on it and it's unpredictable. And I think that's why it's so important to remember that, you know, no matter what these CEOs or some of these kind of big, bank influence influential people are saying i mean no one honestly knows like to be completely like everyone wants to know when the market's going to go back up or when things are going to cool off and i don't think anyone here knows either so everyone just yeah. talk their book like if i ever give exactly. you a formulated opinion on like a singular stock like i'm probably long or short then wait i'll pose a question to jeremy jeremy do you think if food inflation stays sticky let's just say food inflation stays sticky through 2024 do you think the market could still do a reversal and retest all time highs despite that if everything else cools off? Well, first of all, you know, on a near term perspective for inflation, I think a lot of the port congestion that we're going to see, you know, hit hit the L.A. ports um, coming out of China now that they're you know close to getting back to a full reopening. I think that's probably going to have a two, three month lag. So even if inflation does come down, let's say, I don't know, what, what what's the estimates for this upcoming one? 8.2%? percent you have point, that tweet? Eight, eight, which, is, which is, that's higher than last time. So let, yeah, but that's the no, 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 year no. It was 8.2 last time. The last one was 8.32. Oh, it was 8.3, okay. Yeah, before so that was 8.5. And if you look on top, do you guys see the tweet? Like this breaks down all the sectors of the CPI headline number, the core number, the services, which is without food and energy. You have the goods that is again uh, excluding food and energy. Then you have the food, and then you have the energy numbers on top. So, this okay, so, so regardless, this, yeah. regardless, this co- this comes back to my point. You know, the year over year comps are going to be elevated. So, you'll have economists come out and say that inflation is peaking, but. You know, as I mentioned earlier, with the supply constraints that did stem from these China lockdowns, I think any cooling in inflation is probably going to come from, you know, signs of demand destruction, whether that's from the lower end consumer. And what does that mean? That means that the earnings revisions we're probably going to see in the back end of this year are also going to come down. And what's the main driver of stock prices? Earnings. So, like, that that's kind of like the conundrum we're in here that the reasons that inflation might be coming down might not just be because, you know, overall um, the supply side is overall, you know, cooling to an extent where we can be moving forward back towards that 2% inflation target. It's probably going to be more from the demand side and that's going to be reflected in companies' earnings. That's why I'm a bit skeptical on the short term horizon, but there's another point I need to bring up here. And it's like, I'd like to say something. I don't think inflation has reached its peak because I think gas is going to rise the rest of the summer. And like, so that's going to keep inflation like art, maybe artificially propped up if everything else drops. I think when we talk about prices, we usually talk about core, but that's exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm referring to. I could see inflation reaching 9% by July. I don't know if the core print were were to uh, miss the upside, you know, on Friday, then that would be overall extremely bearish for equities. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen because I do think we're seeing some components of demand destruction come in, whether that's from exogenous effects, you know, from elevated gas prices, whether that would be, you know, um, LNG or oil. But regardless, back to my original point, I think we're going through this period of like rampant deglobalization. And you can see that in multiple, you know, parts of the world right now. You have China being extremely wishy-washy about, you know, where their intentions are, about, you know, how they're necessarily running their economy. Um, they kind of have all these large tech corporations, like, um, you know, if, you, if you're like a finger puppet at a show, um, you know, by the string. And then add on to that, you know, OPEC's whole, um, you know, viewpoints on when they want to pump production. They went through the entire... Uh, the COVID lockdowns really brought things to perspective of, you know, how they have to act moving forward. So I'm just interested to see whether there's kind of this, you know, new inflationary target that the United States might be dealing with moving forward. But obviously demand is going to be the thing that 
uh, needs to be watched here, and it probably will reach a point where, you know, the the, the supply demand imbalances should equalize to an extent where we might get towards that target. But I'm not necessarily sure if that comes within the next year and a half, kind of to your point of like the mid summer rally stock duck. I was saying earlier that that there's been overinvestment, which is a deflationary force for what it's worth. Um, like there are too many software startups, there are too many blockchains, and there are too many biotech companies. There was a biotech company that got acquired for $4 billion the other day. And the, 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 tar the kind of cancer they're targeting is very small. And there are like six other companies that have the same drug. So like, ultimately, I think there's room for a few of them. But you, you've seen a lot of like uh, VC rounds that are really big um, in the last sort of 12, 12 to 24 months, exempting the last three to six months, of course. And so when I started my last drug company, we had a $90 million Series A. Um, which was one of the biggest uh, ever uh, at the time. And that was 2015. Um, and then, you know, since then, you know, there have been 100, 200, 300 million dollar Series A's, which is crazy for a brand new company to raise 300 million dollars. doesn't make a lot of sense. And um, no company like that is worth a billion dollars that just started. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So we're getting the reckoning right now. And um, I think those that raised the capital are smart, right? They raised a lot of money at a really high price. And they're going to sort of stick it out for the inevitable reckoning that's going to be tough where you can't raise money under any circumstance. If you remember 07, 08, and 09, you basically, capital markets were closed. There was no way to raise money unless, I mean, even the most high quality companies couldn't raise money or do even do debt, debt offerings. So yeah, it's Facebook really actually had a down round run then too. Yeah, yeah, that's really wild. I, I didn't know they had a down round. Yeah, um, they actually went down, I think, from $15 billion to $10 billion. Uh, Oh, TPTX got acquired, um, Turning Point Therapeutics. Um, so yeah, really, really wild kind of turn of events there. Uh, I think Bristol Myers probably overpaid, but regardless, um, point is there's, um, you know, there was an oversupply of, of capital in biotech. And I think, you know, we're sort of seeing a little bit of that too. So I don't, uh, it's not just that like, this is the cheapest market ever for biotech. There are some good values, but there's no doubt there was an oversupply. And part of that was like Moderna worked out. So flagship could could raise as much money as they want and other VCs uh, as well. So had some good exits like cell therapy was sort of a, a hot area. And so all these cell therapy startups were able to raise a ton of money, even though cell therapy is not looking so great as a kind of a general idea. So I think oversupply happened in a lot of spaces. I mean, software was the biggest one. We were talking about Tiger the other day that they did 350 deals in 350 days or something like that. I don't know. They uh, deployed very... a record amount of capital the first half of this year. I think they raised like an insane amount and they deployed, I think, like 70, 80% of it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, if you've ever invested in privates, I think to do it right, it's really hard. Like you have to meet the people. You really have to sort of get to know them. You're making a big commitment when you invest in a private company because the risks are just so much higher. You can't just wake up one day and press the sell button. Um, and you require an exit, right? You require some kind of IPO situation to get out of your investment so to make several hundred um, of those investments in, in just as many days i mean how much due diligence can you really do you know it's a really really tricky you know kind of thing to get in, into these companies now software is a great place is the winds at your back right but it's still like you know doesn't mean you know everything you touch in software is going to work out and i think to the extent you have you know 30 or 40 companies ch chasing the same exact idea that's probably not a good thing either. You know, um, not every one of those companies is going to do a round at 500 million or a billion pre, uh, raise 100 or 200 and make it out uh, with a positive return. I think almost all of them will go bankrupt. And business cycle is back. I mean, that's basically it, right? <laughs> the business cycle has not been abstracted away. It's been 14 years without a business cycle. The business cycle has been off. So now we're seeing the other side of it. Yeah, I think you're spot on on the software piece specifically. I forget the stat I was reading, but the amount of companies that actually generate a 1 billion IRR versus the amount that are valued uh, in the billions is actually pretty crazy, the divergence there. And like you're also right about the private markets because they usually get hit last. So a lot of these companies that kind of propped up their value, I mean, props to them, but they're also going to have to manage that cash because you have to expect no infusion of capital in the next 12 to 18 months, most likely. And also the point you mentioned about chasing the same names, only the best companies may be able to raise. And I think I was reading, I'm pretty sure this is right. Um, Coinbase is like, for example, valued less than it was in their last round, right? So whichever round they, were, they had last, I'm sure many other public companies are 
kind of having that pressure. So if there's no they exit point, in the uh, job offers as well. Yep, rescinding job offers. They were part of the hiring fee. It's crazy, by the way, what I read on the job offers piece because a lot of those students that were on the H H one Bs and didn't accept other offers, and I'm sure this affects other companies as well. But it's just insane what's going on. And I think to Jeremy's point earlier, you're going to see a lot of this come out uh, later in the year where you have these type of effects hit companies as we kind of see. Uh, the markets cool off, like for example, hiring and decelerating in that is, is one of the biggest things, right? So that, that affects um, kind of macroeconomic pressure and you're continuously seeing more and more of that. And I think it's only going to increase if I'm not wrong. I mean, Microsoft already revised its guidance last week, which was kind of crazy. It didn't even drop in Snapchat. Well, Girl, what was that tweet that you put out? That was really funny. Theoretically, that was an FX move, right? But um, Yeah, 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 no, for sure. I think um I do think we're going to get downward revisions. I mean uh in a lot of them. Yeah, probably, right? I mean, it would be really shocking if we didn't at this point. The market sounds so much that if companies start meeting their old numbers and stuff like that, it'd be the market will rally pretty hard and it's possible that happens. Like again, I believe in what Blank Fine and even Jim Cramer are saying like it's there's no reason to think that business is falling off a cliff and the really perceptive question we had earlier from I believe Mary Lou that um you know is reflexivity a thing yeah the reflexivity you know being a real thing uh or maybe not you know we'll see but i'm just going to add that you know when you're running a company i've been a like three or four time ceo uh of starting and founder of companies i think the most important thing is to have profits and that's part of the reason i, I raised the dare print price not to talk about that i'm glad we haven't got any questions about that but like you have the right to be profitable i mean <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> and i think you oh, know making yeah. making sure that you're not bleeding money for years and years and years like uh, everyone asked me like some media idiots at like forbes or wherever um asked me like oh why don't you just raise rent venture capital money i'm like dude you, you've never run a company huh like clearly you know basically one of the problems is the financing window can close at any given time and what if i go to my investors and they don't want to invest what if i go to my investors and they want 90 percent of the company for five million dollars you know what am i supposed to do go to my employees and say hey yeah you're all fired sorry you know i couldn't find a way to become profitable um, we had to take money from um, Jeffrey Epstein, and he owns 95% of the company, and he wants to do an offsite on his island. You know, I don't want to be in a situation like that. And it's just one of these things that, yeah, you know. Did, did that happen, or is that hypothetical? No, that was a hypothetical. But, um, you know, the point is, you know, I was just talking to a founder who um, took money from Sequoia earlier, and he was like, yeah, it sucked. You know, I, I really had a bad experience. I don't want to do a startup again because it was so bad and painful. And you know, you know, unless you've built a company yourself, you know, you know, I wouldn't go around saying, oh, yeah, just raise 50 million from a consortium of VCs. Like it's pulling teeth. It's not easy. Ba bad and painful in what sense, Enrique? Well, I don't want to belabor the, the Sequoia thing. Um, you know, he was introspective about it. Um, they're a great firm, you know, don't get me wrong. Yeah, um, no, I've, obviously. Yeah, I've heard good things about them. So, you know, he just, I think, went through the VC ringer. He was like, how did you deal with all those suits and all those, you know, because he's a really creative kind of you know, different kind of guy. And I was like, man, it's painful. It's, it's, if you're really creative and brilliant, like the hardest thing in the world to do is meet with a, a quote unquote investment committee and pharma VC. That's the worst thing. You can have a partner really love you, but then it's like, oh, I have to get this through committee. And it's like, man, I can't get less about your committee. You know, are you writing a check or not? And it's like, we'll get back to you after the sixth round of due diligence and what our consultants will, you know, are going to, you know, and I just went to hedge funds and raised money from them because they don't have a committee. They have a guy sitting there who says yes or no. And then by, he has ADHD. And by the time, you know, he's even written the check, he's on to the next trade. You know, that's the kind of investor you want, to be honest, that'll let you breathe and let you make money um, for, for your investors. So in any event, those are a couple errant thoughts, but let's go to some questions. Do you think there's ever a point where a founder should ask for a lower valuation? Because we've seen yes. a lot of cases where founders raise at such a huge valuation and then maybe the idea never really gets to come to fruition because they're burning so much money that they can't raise oh, money. Oh man, that's an Dude, awesome this question. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I just gave you the Facebook example, right? They actually um, did that like intentionally, right? And I think it was the best, one of the better decisions that yeah. Mark made. And if out. I'm not wrong, the revenue was up almost 4x, correct? Yeah, the revenue was up. This is and after this, they, and they raised... made 10x more adjusted every day. Yep. That's the funniest part. No, but in all seriousness, like um, one of the other things is is the stock market. So um, when your stock goes up enough, I've never met a CEO that um, other than maybe Elon Musk, who said, oh, my stock's up too much. Everyone else is sort of like, 
oh yeah, you know, our, our socks a goodbye. And it's like, well, you told me it was a goodbye at 10. It's still a goodbye at 30. And now it's still a goodbye at 50. And you haven't changed anything. Like, why is it still a goodbye? And it's because CEOs aren't financial people. And I think that's like very clear. In most cases, operators are not financial people. And that's why Berkshire is the only company that invests its balance sheet. And I actually had a lot of controversy with some of my old boards that because we would take the cash flow from our pharmaceutical business and invest it. And it was a really in pharmaceutical companies. And we did, our returns were spectacular. And we got, I got a lot of criticism. Um, if you want to look at one example, I bought um, a good percentage, uh, more than 5%, maybe more than 10% of a company called Clinuvel when it was a 60, 60, $60 million market cap. Now it's over a billion dollar market cap. I, when I left the company I'm talking about, they dumped all the Clinivell stock for 60 million market cap <laughs> because they said, uh, well, we're a drug company, so we shouldn't be investing. That's not our core competency. We make medicine. We don't invest. And it's like, listen, if your core competency is medicine, you should be able to tell when a, another drug company is attractive or not, right? It doesn't make any sense. You I mean, know. you have to, it's, it works the same way with M&A. Like if, you, if you're good at M&A of other drug companies, you're buying other drug companies because they're cheap. So it's the same skill set. Um, so the problem is- also, if I'm not wrong, if you look back, Warren Buffett said he would not buy back Berkshire it was, if it was above 1.3 times the book value. The case right. says this. No one else other than Warren Buffett says this. That's a really insightful point. Um, you have a lot of insight for a lot of the stuff you've been saying. I never heard of you before, but you know, you you... You have a tremendous amount of insight on these things. So the funny thing is corporate buybacks are often like some of the worst uh, timed purchases, like companies are buying back. If you, know, if you are buying cheap stock, I love that. But if you buy a stock that 100 times earnings, deploy that capital somewhere else. Like upstart, why are you buying back equity? Deploy the capital and you're in business. Companies like Intel that are cheap, buy the stock. I love that. I love to be long the company. But... If Tesla does a does a buyback, they're wasting the capital. Yeah, in fact, you yeah. should be doing the opposite. When your stock's yeah. up a lot, you should do a secondary. Yep. <laughs> and that's all. You can't short you it. You can raise more capital, exactly. Uh, exactly. Like, look at AMD, NVIDIA. They are did Shopify equity. raise more? Because Toby was so, very so, cocky so, last year, so, too. So, they Remember did him? raise around once, but he got way too cocky. He was and, super cocky, and then now he's calling out Wall Street analysts. Exactly. That's what happened. But same as DraftKings, the CEO dumped half a billion of his equity. And a month ago, he says, my end goal is to make everyone regret who sold my stock. My first question was, they might go to you, I, I mean, no, no, my, my first question was, you yourself sold half a billion of your equity and you're calling people out to sold your stock. That makes zero sense. That's Lead not your example. job. Exactly. Lead by example. Yeah, I think Dude, you the same thing happened with AMC, right? Uh, I mean, exactly. The CEO well, and CFO uh, so sold funny. all their shares. Doesn't uh, Stock Talk, isn't he long AMC or something? You commonly, you know, see vanity as a driving factor of value within NFTs, uh, board, AP Yacht, board AP Yacht Club. Uh, currently often is an example of that. How do you view the rise of free minting versus what you used to see with things like Board API Yacht, board Yacht Club uh, in terms of uh, the NFT community? Uh, you know, the free mint seem to be driving a lot of um, community involvement. It seems to nurture a lot more um genuine you know active involvement in the community do you do you think that that's important uh, or do you think that art or utility is more important um it sounds like you have an opinion more than a question but i i will uh i will say it sorry, yeah. no no it's okay <laughs> um it sounds like uh i mean i think it depends on on the situation right i mean i think it's a cool thing to raise money for a great project using the mechanism right but i think at the same time like you know, you want, you want to encourage accessibility too. So it's, it's, and again, I also have serious questions about the viability of the media medium and the, the sector anyway. Right. So I think like art is, art's a weird space. Like artists aren't, aren't supposed to be famous in their time. You know, if you look at Van Gogh or, or others, art, artists aren't supposed to kind of be famous in their time. You know, some artists are obviously, um, you know, but, um, it's hard to do because time time's supposed to be the judge of art's quality. So the idea that like the price of an NFT can vary 
by 100x within two weeks is sort of a testament to speculation, maybe more than, um, and tulip bulbism, I think, or tulipism more than it is art quality. Because art, um, as a collector of fine art, um, I could tell you that, you know, prices don't change that much. You know, um, in, a, in a really bubblicious environment, uh, the price of a painting could double, maybe triple, right? So we're not, what we're seeing right now isn't art, I don't think. Because if you, if you take Bored Apes as a collection, right, you're talking about $2 billion. There is no artwork by Da Vinci or by Dali or by anyone that has ever sold for that much, right? Da Vinci's um, uh, Salvador de Mundi, um, savior of the world, if you will, uh, $450 million purchased in a, you know, by Mohammed bin Salman and sort of an ultimate kind of like brag, brag purchase, right? Probably beat out Bill Gates or one or two other people um, for that uh, purchase. And uh, we probably will see, like if the Mona Lisa were on sale, it probably eclipsed several billion dollars. Um, same thing with... Um, um, da Vinci's other masterpiece, uh, The Last Supper. So there are some priceless works of art. Um, and Board Ape Yacht Club is apparently more priceless. So to me, that's like, you know, really kind of ridiculous. Um, you could argue it's it's one piece of art, or you could argue it's 10,000 pieces of art. I would strongly argue it's one piece of art. Um, you know, and ultimately there is fabulous modern art. I do think people um, produce some of that. I, Jeff Koons is obviously a very um, formidable artist that prices are, of his work are enormous. Uh, even Andy Warhol recently sold for a lot. But to me, I don't think the NFTs belong in the same even discussion, quite frankly, um, other than perhaps Beeple, um, who is really a, a bona fide artist. So to me, I, I think like the good thing about this stuff is the community, right, is all the kind of like uh, collaboration and stuff like that. But I think it's it's fairly ugly when you when you look at kind of the rug pulling and the kind of derivativeness of every project and things like that. So I, I'd encourage the sort of free mints for most of the stuff that doesn't require work. But if you want to build a real ecosystem and a real kind of, you know, I don't know, sort of more robust sort of project, I don't see anything wrong with picking a market, you know, letting the market determine your price or picking your own price. Cause ultimately, you know, the market will clear one way or the other. Right. Um, like Enrique was saying, like the NFT sector is really in a weird kind of perverted space right now where it's really not about the art and it's more about people gambling right now to be honest with you because most people are just in nfts to make money that's just the sad fact about it right now and it's not really about the art um with the free mints and stuff like that it's just i don't know i have my own strong opinions on that but also i'm a firm believer in under promising and over delivering um which is not going to be the overhyped projects. If you see a lot of the overhyped projects right now, they're all pretty much flopping. And people are just going to like the antithesis of like what has been like the mainstream. So like the goblins take off because it's so bad, it's good. Um, and people are just really like grasping at straws right here in the NFT space. But there's a lot of innovation to be had. But like Enrique said earlier, it's just it's just flooded with the same 10K PFP collections that people are just kind of getting tired of.